Okay, so just for everyone's awareness, this meeting is now being recorded. Um, and the presentation and all the materials, the slides, etc. We'll just share with you afterwards. Okay, so, uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, parallel computing with MATLAB and Simulink. Uh, my name is Dhruv. I work for the education team at the MathWorks. And uh, several of my colleagues are on the call. So, uh, Vipul is uh, observing. Um, and then we have Deepshika who will help me with the sharing the attendance form uh, shortly. Uh, Ma'am, anything else to say before we start? Any instructions or anything? Uh, nothing from my end. You can start, Dhruv. Okay, ma'am. So, uh, I hope that uh, we will all have had a chance to download the files I shared before. Uh, if all of you can please find the chat menu and just write yes or no. Uh, have you already downloaded the files that we shared? Uh, and I hope everyone has installed MATLAB on their desktop or laptop. Because MATLAB online won't work for this. We need to have the installed version. Okay, does anyone need me to share the files again? Just let me know right now and I will share it. So if you can please post in the chat menu or unmute yourself and talk, uh, that will be very helpful. Uh, and the point of this session is to keep it very, very interactive. So uh, we are here to help you out. We, are help, we, are, we want to help you parallelize your code. Uh, and get your work done faster. So it, the more feedback you can give us, uh, the better we can help you. Okay. Okay, I'm seeing mostly yes in the chat, so I guess people are all right. I'll share the link anyway once we get started. Okay, so uh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, firstly, you know, maybe you're in this session because your MATLAB code is running slow. Uh, maybe you just want to run a lot of simulations in Simulink. Or uh, perhaps you know you have a lot of millions of computations that you need results from uh, to do your PhD or to complete your master's thesis or whatever. So this is what this session is all about. Uh, we're going to show you how to do all of this stuff faster. Now, depending on where your interest is, we can focus more on MATLAB or more on GPUs or more on Simulink, etc. Uh, and this session will be for approximately, uh, I believe, two hours or so, two and a half hours. Uh, and keep on asking questions, please. Okay, so three things we'll look at today. Uh, the first is how do we accelerate our serial MATLAB code? So this is the traditional line by line. Uh, sorry, could you mute, please? Whoever is talking. Uh, yeah, so the first thing we look at is how to accelerate serial MATLAB code, which is what we write traditionally line by line. Uh, then we look at how to speed up computation with the parallel computing toolbox. So this is what you install on your desktop machine uh, or your laptop. And then finally, at the end, we will look at how to scale up to a full-scale cluster uh, or Amazon Web Services using MATLAB Parallel Server. So your institute uh, now has this uh, MATLAB installed on your cluster. So after this session, you can you know try to submit jobs and things. Uh, we will share some instructions on how to do that. Uh, yeah, a few points before starting. So this is an intermediate level session. Uh, we hope most of you did the MATLAB simulating trainings last week. So the basics, uh, we are going to assume you know the, these by you know this point. Uh, the examples we we will use, they might not be from your specific research area, but that doesn't matter because what matters is how you structure the code. Uh, so never mind if it's a mechanical example or, or electrical or whatever. Um, it will still work with your code. Uh, if you have questions after the session, this is my email address. Uh, you can always, uh, you know, reach out afterwards and we will be happy to help on your research. Uh, or if you want to teach using any of these tools, we're happy to help with that as well. All right. So first thing, um, the first thing we recommend is before even going to parallel computing, just figure out how to speed up your normal MATLAB code that you write. Okay, so how can we do this? Uh, one of the things is use the latest version because the MATLAB code uh, that you will run today in the latest version will be probably twice as fast uh, as it was four years ago because we keep optimizing the engines, we keep adjusting the you know libraries to the newer hardware. 
So uh, the newer versions of MATLAB will be able to utilize your hardware better. Okay. Uh, this is a graph. Again, this is about one year out of date, one and a half years. Uh, but if you look at the speed from 2015 to 2020, the same code will actually run faster today in a, in a later version of MATLAB, almost twice as fast. And what happens with all of these techniques we are showing you today is that they multiply with each other. So you get two times speed up here, three times speed up there, four times there, multiply it all together. Uh, you will be able to do weeks of work in minutes. Second thing is uh, we recommend using built-in functions and data types. So when uh, we build certain kinds of functions or we utilize data types, we try to make sure that they are optimized for the application. So if you use the functions that we have provided, uh, generally speaking, they will be quite robust uh, and they will be very fast because they have been optimized specifically to work with, uh, you know, the data type that we have specified. Uh, again, these are all extensively documented and they're tested with each other. So you can always refer to the documentation to see how to use these newer functions. Uh, once we get into the hands-on part, uh, we will see a few examples of these. Okay. And uh, of course, some functions, some of you might be using these. So functions like FFT, fast Fourier transform or IG uh, for eigenvalues or uh, SVD or sort. Uh, these kinds of functions have been multi-threaded since 2008, which means they will by default use uh, multiple CPU cores. So you don't even need to go to parallel computing. If you use certain inbuilt functions, MATLAB will automatically use all the hardware that is in your computer um, as efficiently as possible. Okay. So with these tips in mind, uh, let me show you a few more efficient programming practices and then uh, I'll, I'll tell you how much of a speed up you can get from this. So number one, um, sorry, was that a question? Okay. So number one, try using functions instead of scripts because functions are generally faster. They don't hold uh, much stuff in memory. Uh, second thing is instead of resizing arrays dynamically, it's generally much better to pre-allocate the memory. So if you know that I'm going to use, you know, thousand by thousand by thousand array, uh, don't resize that in every iteration of a for loop. Just pre-allocate that in the beginning and it will run much, much faster because uh, all that memory is already in place. Another tip is uh, we should create a new variable rather than assigning a uh, data of a different type of variable. Uh, I'll show you an example of this. Again, this helps with the memory management on the back end. Uh, vectorize. So this is kind of like a unique strength of MATLAB. Uh, Instead of using for loops, if you have big matrices and big vectors for doing your mathematics, you should be using uh, not for loops, but vectorized operations. Uh, and they run really, really fast because you're basically just applying a function on one variable. Uh, again, I'll show you an example of this, but I'm just telling you the tips in one place. So it will make sense later. Uh, fifth point, this is a good debugging practice, but actually if you print too much data on the screen, uh, it will slow down your system because the graphics driver has to be called uh, and data has to be sent on the screen. So once you have finished debugging, what we advise is don't put, put too much data on your screen. Uh, it will slow it down by almost a hundred times, you know, uh, depending on what it is. And uh, finally, don't change the directory of the folder. So change directory, add path, remove path. Uh, avoiding the use of this will also speed up your uh, MATLAB functions quite a lot. Okay, so let's see an example of this. We, we've talked quite a lot. Let's see an example. So I'd like people to look at this script, please. What we're doing is we're declaring an array. Then we're doubling that array, every element. Uh, then we're going to take a string. Uh, and basically we're going to count up the number of spaces inside this string using a for loop and just a counter, okay? So based on what you have just learned, you know, two minutes ago, uh, can you point out what I'm doing wrong here in this uh, script on the left-hand side? And I, I would like some interaction, please. You can just unmute and talk or post in the chat. Yeah, uh, can I say? Yes, uh, please. 
Yeah, the first part you're using is only the time you're using. That's a bit of a question. Uh, sorry, your audio is not very clear. Uh, could you repeat, please? Uh, the first loop, whole loop, you can allow this whole loop by simply using the better addition. Okay, so I can replace this entire loop. I can just double this using vectorized operations. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything I'm doing here, which could be better? Okay. What am I doing here? So I'm using this variable and this variable. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? Anybody? Assigning the, the assigning a different method by I mean just to say like you're defining an error and using that uh, double error uh host in the error that can be overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay. So one thing was I was using a for loop here. I can use vectorized uh, operations. Second thing was there was dynamic memory allocation. So each for loop I'm making the size of this array B bigger. Okay. Third thing, uh, we recycled this variable. So I was using this variable to store numbers and now I'm using it to store characters, right? So this memory has to be released on the back end and then it has to be again allocated in the front end here. So this slows down our system. Uh, again, I'm using a for loop here uh, and I'm using an if statement here. So every character of this line sentence has to be checked. Uh, now, if I wanted to do the same thing in a more efficient way, okay, just look at the code on the right hand side. Within, uh, you know, four lines of code, I can actually write all of this stuff. It is much neater. It is much easier to understand. And more importantly, uh, it's also three times faster. Okay, so what will happen is if you follow the coding practices that we have suggested, for example, you're using MATLAB 2015 and you're writing this kind of code. Now, suddenly you jump to a modern version of MATLAB, you know, six years worth of updates, and you, use, you start using the inbuilt functions and vectorized operations. So that's two times speed up there, three times speed up here. Multiply that, you will get approximately six times faster just from doing that. So if your code was taking six hours to run, now it will just finish in something like one hour. So this is the this is the first thing we typically recommend. Uh, optimize your serial code. Make sure your code is neat. You're using the right kinds of operations. Uh, and what will happen is uh, this will also help when we get to the parallel computing side because typically we are looking at big problems. So this will help. Uh, and the key takeaways here are that the better programming habits will lead to faster code. Do use vectorized operations uh, and do use a lot of the built in functions as far as possible. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So I'll share one more trick before we get to the parallel computing side. Okay. Uh, I'll be quick about this. So actually, oh, there are two more things. Uh, yeah. So what else can we do? Uh, we can use these commands tick and talk to time how long our code is taking. So tick stands for time and clock and talk stands for time out clock. So if you write tick and then write all your code in the middle and then write talk at the end, it will tell you how long that piece of code took to execute. So using this, you can analyze how much time each part of the code is taking. And then you can start optimizing the bottlenecks, the places where it's slowing down. Uh, MATLAB profiler is also there to help you uh, do this more auto automatically. Uh, you can read up on this, you know, just Google it. Uh, another trick is if you're doing a lot of computation, uh, load the common variables from a file instead of executing code for uh, generating them. Because if it is the same piece of computation you're doing again and again, just store it in a .mat file, load it up, um, and it will work much faster. Okay. Now for advanced users, uh, I won't spend too long on this. What you can also do is you can generate a MEX file, uh, which is a C, C++ or a CUDA code uh, from a MATLAB function. So MATLAB is a high level language. It's very easy to program in, but uh, something like C++, which is a compiled language, it runs closer to the hardware. It is much faster. So 
sometimes you will get you know five times ten times speed up just by converting a piece of MATLAB code into C C C plus uh, plus, and there is a, something called MATLAB coder which is given uh, that helps you do this. You don't have to do this manually. MATLAB will do this automatically for you. Um, before I spend time here, I would just like to see maybe uh, some indications in the chat. Is anyone interested in seeing this? The MEX file generation? If not, we can just skip it and go to parallel. So if you are interested in seeing this, just tell me in the chat. Otherwise, we'll skip it. Okay, one person. Uh, Two people, I guess. Uh, I'll try to show this quickly. All right. So uh, this demo is also in the same files that I've provided, by the way. So all the files that we show today are uh, with you already. So inside the demos folder, I've given a code generation folder, which is an example of this. Uh, and let's see how this works. So Basically, what we have here is, uh, I'll tell you what the application is. So there's a certain application uh, that we have written in MATLAB that if you provide an image like this, okay, it's just an image with some colored chips lying on a table. We want to write a MATLAB function that will just detect these green chips, okay? And detecting these green chips is just a matter of detecting which color is there. So it's just an if operation. If the color is green, then you select that pixel. So we are first going to write a .m file for it, which is a MATLAB file. And then we're going to convert it using the MATLAB coder to a C file. Uh, and then we can see, you know, how much difference there is in execution time for this. So it's exactly the same application, exactly the same hardware. Just using MATLAB coder will speed it up a lot. So the way it works is, uh, First, let me look at the MATLAB script. So this is a function that I have created. It's in the files that I've shared. It's in the demos and then code generation folder. It's called create mask.m. So in this function, what we're doing is we're saying uh, create mask of an image I and the output is black and white, that image that we saw. So what we're going to do is we are going to declare some thresholds for three channels, red, green, blue. And we're going to say you for the pixel you want to select, we should have a low value of red, high value of green, and low value of the blue color. If you know image processing, this will make sense. If you don't know image processing, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's basically just selecting the green color in that image. That's what it's doing. Uh, at the end of this is a matrix operation. So we are just saying if the value inside that pixel is within these thresholds that we have specified, then you output a black pixel, otherwise output a white pixel. So this is what's happening in this slide, as you can see. Uh, we have some colored chips sitting on the table. Uh, if there is any green region, this function will output a white uh, kind of output, otherwise it will make the whole thing black. Okay, so that's what the script does. So, when I run the script, uh, there is a separate script called compare results.m. So what I can do is I can load up uh, some image with these colored chips. Okay, and then I can run this MATLAB function and I can see how much time it takes. So let me run this. And we see it takes around 0 0.02 seconds. So it's not very slow, but if you were processing millions of images, uh, this would start to add up very quickly, okay? Because multiply this by 10 to the 6, then you have a lot of time. So what we want to do is we want to convert this MATLAB script uh, into a MEX, you know, a, a kind of a C file. Uh, the way to do that is very, very simple. So basically we just go to apps and we open up uh, an app called MATLAB Coder. So it has the C icon built on it. So I select MATLAB coder, and then it will bring up a wizard which will help me, you know, uh, define my entire code. So first thing, the first step is just to select which function you're trying to convert. 
So I just click on this uh, browse button. I go to uh, my function create mask dot m and uh, I'm just going to overwrite my existing project because I already had it done. I go next. Next, is will, uh, it will ask me how do you want to call this function? So I already have a script here which says compare results, which will call that function. So I navigate to that one. Uh, if you want to see this in detail, again, there are tutorials on the internet. I'm just showing you the speed comparison. Okay, the purpose is not the instruction. The purpose is just to make you aware that this exists. So I hit next. So now I've specified the function and how to call it. Now MATLAB will automatically convert that MATLAB script into C++ or, or probably C if I'm using this. And it will automatically generate the code. It will test the code and it will tell me if there were any problems. Okay, so you don't have to do anything by hand. It, MATLAB will do it for you. Okay, so the trial code has been generated. The executable, executable has been built uh, and the test file has been run once. Okay, now I just go next. So this is all inside the wizard. Uh, I can say the build type should be a MEX file. So you can either get the C, C++ source code or a DLL uh, or any, any one of these options. I'm just going to go with a MEX file because I want to call it from inside MATLAB. Uh, call it create mask. And uh, I guess I can, you know, just uh, generate this file. Okay, I think I've done it properly. If there's any mistake, I'll probably just share the link afterwards. Okay, so it says uh, it has succeeded. Now, if I click on any of these files, I can actually see the equivalent code that is in the background. So this is all written by MATLAB. Uh, I didn't write any of this, you see. Okay. So the header files, the .c files, everything has been automatically created for me. Uh, this is the actual function, create mask.c. Okay, now what I can do is I just hit next and then finish this. And then what I can do is I can call uh, this max file from inside MATLAB. So when I call this, you see the time it takes now is much less than what it was before. So before it took 0 0.0218, now it is 0 0.0154. If I run this a few more times, it will be even faster. Okay, now 0 0.0098. What happens is once that function gets cached in your memory of the computer, it will be called more easily. So second time you see the time was much less. Now if I compare how much speed up we got from this, I can divide the time for MATLAB by the time for the compiled function. Uh, and you can see it's almost 17 times faster. Okay. So that is that means that if you had a MATLAB function, uh, that takes you almost, let's say, two weeks to give you results. You convert it to C, C++, you might be finished in one day. So 17 times speed up on the same hardware for the same problem. So these things we show you first because uh, going to parallel computing may not even be necessary. If you know how to program properly, uh, the stuff you can do just with serial optimization is much, much more powerful than most people are aware of. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? I hope this was useful, by the way. Most people are not aware of these things. So was this useful, people? Uh, if you can just write yes or no, it will really help. Uh, just so I know I'm making sense. Okay, a couple of people say yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, if there are any doubts or any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll carry on and go to something else. Um, can I ask a doubt here? Yes, please. Yeah, so this uh, this conversion from MATLAB to C++, uh, mm -hmm. will it be possible for all kinds of MATLAB scripts or are there any limitations uh, for this process? Yes, uh, good question. So basically, the function has to be code generatable. Okay, uh, so let me show you the list. So MATLAB code generation uh, support. 
So if you type MATLAB code generation supported functions, uh, you can basically get the list. So not all of the toolboxes will be supported. So things like signal processing, image processing, these will have a lot of features which are supported for code generation. Uh, but actually you will have to go and check inside here, right? So there's a huge list of functions which are supported. Um, okay, sure. Thank you. Yeah, and, and when you run the wizard, it will tell you which function is not supported. So then you can find some alternative for it. Okay, okay so MATLAB code is what you need to look at. I'll just copy the link. Here. <clears throat> okay. So I think people get that. That's easy enough. Um, I don't think there are many Simulink users here, so I'll just skip the Simulink aspects mostly. Uh, I'll just tell you a couple of quick tips. If if you want more, then just let me know. So this was for MATLAB, right? This is for MATLAB. You speed it up by doing first optimize the code, run the latest version, use the C++ method. Uh, how do you speed up Simulink? So in Simulink, if you are running it, there is like a normal mode and then there is accelerator mode. So what happens in accelerator mode is certain portions of the model are compiled to C code. So again, the same effect happens inside Simulink. Uh, it will compile just in time, uh, GIT compilation, and it will have less overhead. So it will take a little bit of time to generate the code, but after that your simulation runs very fast. So if you have to run hundreds of simulations, try the accelerator mode. And if you have to run very, very long simulations, where you know things are not changing very much like uh, you're modeling a power grid you want to run a simulation for several months right what you can do then is you can try the rapid accelerator mode so this will take the entire model convert it to c++ uh, and then it runs on a separate core of your machine so in that case you will get huge speed ups i mean 20 30 40 times speed ups uh, and your simulations will finish faster the trade-off is the debugging capabilities will be disabled. So, you know, you will find out only at the end if it was successful, not successful, etc. So if you're into Simulink, then try these things out uh, in case of problems after the session, tell me, okay? Uh, and here is just a comparison of, you know, what else you can do. So normal mode, you know, starts very fast, but it takes a long time. Uh, accelerator mode will take a little bit of overhead computational overhead, but runs faster. Rapid accelerator mode takes a lot of time to compile, but after that it runs even faster. And you can also use the fast restart capability if you want to uh, keep the same model. So if you don't want to change the models between different runs, you just change the parameters, then you can also use fast restart. Okay, so now for something different. Uh, what we have talked about so far, it's been almost 30 minutes. We have talked about using one core of your computer. But if you're on any modern computer, even if you're on a laptop, uh, it will probably have four cores, right? Uh, if you're on a more powerful workstation, you might have eight, 16, 32 cores. Uh, if you're on a cluster, then you might have hundreds of cores available. So these are CPU cores we are talking about. Uh, in case you have access to a GPU, which is a graphics processing unit, again, you will have hundreds or thousands of cores, right? So what, what we have done so far is on one core, yes, we can write very, very efficient software. It will run fast. But how do you utilize the rest of this hardware that you have? The way to do this is to use the parallel computing toolbox. If you want to run the code on your local machine, so this is always my recommended option. And if you want, if even that is not enough, you still want to take it one step further, then you can go to MATLAB parallel server, uh, and this will work for remote clusters or for cloud computing. So uh, as I mentioned, your uh, computer center has this installed now in the cluster. So you have access to all of these options now, okay? There's no limitation. You can use it on your machine or you can scale it up to a cluster. We'll talk about the whole process today. Right. <coughs> so first of all, what is parallel computing? So uh, the thing to understand about serial code is 
you know you have little blocks of code or functions they are being called one by one and they are they are being executed one by one no matter how many cpus you have uh, in parallel computing what we do is we break up the code in such a way that you know different pieces of the code or different pieces of the jobs go to different cores of your cpu hardware and they can be processed at the same time so that is what parallel means okay and once you can do it on your computer then you can also scale it up to a cluster now why is it useful uh, for certain types of applications it will accelerate your uh, excuse me your computation by a lot so one example uh, we will also look at this today in the code uh, i have given you the files already so if we have this kind of a problem uh, maybe it's a mechanical system and you're just trying to vary certain parameters uh, and you want to generate a result over many many different uh, parts of the grid so you know you have an x parameter you are changing the values you have a y parameter you're changing the values and the z result you want to get on a graph and you want to generate that plot again it doesn't matter if it's an electrical system or mechanical or chemical the system doesn't matter uh, point is what are we trying to do so if you're trying to run lots and lots of cases of a single type of problem that is where parallel computing is very useful for doing these parameter sweeps and things like this so uh, just to show you how much faster it can get uh, I will have to explain a few of these concepts. Okay, so first concept is compute time, and this we are going to measure in minutes. So suppose that I have one CPU core. Okay, so workers mean how many CPU cores do you have, and pool means the entire set of CPU cores which is available to you. So suppose I only have one CPU worker available in my local pool. So I can only use one. Uh, you know, problem solving hardware at one time. Suppose I want to solve for 25 values of a given problem. So I want to calculate for 25 points what is happening. Suppose it takes me 0 0.02 minutes. Now, if I go to 400 values, it is going to take me longer. If I go to 40,000 values, even longer. 160,000 values, even longer. So this entire thing here, Okay, I have plotted on the graph, uh, basically kind of down here. So, uh, sorry, oh, that should be the linear reference probably, right? Yeah. So, uh, the what will happen is if you only have one uh, CPU core, whatever job you had to do is just scales with the number of values, the time. Now, what will happen is, suppose you have more CPUs at your disposal. Okay, so more of these jobs will be broken down and they will be sent to different CPU cores and in parallel you can start processing those jobs. Uh, a job is basically just a calculation that you have to complete. Uh, it might be a calculation, you might, it, you might be doing signal processing, you might be doing image processing, it doesn't matter. It's just a job that you have given to a CPU worker. So what we see is as we go up the number of workers in the pool, the time it takes to complete for large values start shrinking. Okay, so suppose I go from one worker up to 200 CPU workers. For 160,000 values, my time just shrinks because instead of taking 70 minutes, I now finish in 0 0.4 minutes, which is just a few seconds. But one thing you will notice here is that this minimum value never goes down. Okay, suppose I had to solve 25 problems. It takes 0 0.02 seconds. I give it to 20 workers, it takes half the time, 0 0.01 seconds. But you will never get below this time. Because even if on, one worker only has one job to complete, at least that one job, that much time will be taken. So in other words, there is like a minimum overhead. Okay. That is the minimum time which you have to spend to solve a problem. But if you go above the number of values, uh, then the com computation scales very well. So uh, what this graph here is showing 
is if you have 160,000 values and on the X axis, we increase the number of workers. Uh, we start getting larger and larger speed ups. And this kind of resembles an asymptotic graph. So it will always be less than linear speed up. So if you have 200 cores, it won't be 200 times faster. It will be about you know, 160 times faster because the data has to be sent between the workers. Uh, but the bigger your problem is and the more workers you have, the more speed up you will get. Okay. I know that was a lot of information in one slide, but uh, any questions like, I'm sure there must be some confusion. Uh, it takes a couple of times to understand this concept. Uh, any doubts? So, as I mentioned, please try to make it more interactive because I can't see your faces. I'm not there in person, right? So, the more you ask, the more I will be able to answer where you are stuck. The main concept here is in parallel computing, you know, the bigger your problem size is and the more CPU workers you have, the more uh, efficient it becomes, basically. I, I have a question. Uh, yes. A question. Uh, see, if you're increasing the number of uh, workers uh, mm -hmm. and uh, will there be any effect on the fixed memory size that you're having? Let's say you are having a RAM of let's say, 8 GBs. And we're increasing mm -hmm. the number of pools. Will there be any uh, negative effect when you increase the number of workers? So the memory will it not be shared between these pools? Uh, is there any concern? Yes. That? Yes. So definitely, when when we get to high performance computing, your normal eight GB RAM will not be enough. So uh, the cluster will have probably multiple no, 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 gigabytes, no, no. hundreds of gigabytes, my, or terabytes. That's not my question. My question was yeah. for a fixed amount of RAM. By increasing yeah. the number of workers, yeah, is there always will there always be an increase in the efficiency, or can it decrease after a certain time? Is it possible that it will decrease after a certain number of workers? Yeah, it might decrease uh, because if we only have you know this much RAM and we keep on increasing the number of workers, the bottleneck will become the RAM instead of the CPU. So in that case, we will need to add more RAM to get more speed up. Okay, yes, that that's what my question was. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe it will become clearer with practice. So, uh, if there are any questions, yeah, just let me know. Okay, but the thing we just wanted to highlight is this one. Now, suppose that uh, I mean this is two hundred times faster because you're doing a lot of values on a lot of cores. So, keep in mind that time is money for many people, right? So, if you're doing a PhD and you had to process a lot of values. And it's going to take you six months to do it. If you master the art of parallel computing, if you know how to use your cluster properly, because it is there in your institute, uh, what might happen is six months of computation you might be able to finish in one day because you are 200 times faster. So we have had these kinds of, you know, very, very good results with many research groups uh, where if you structure your problem properly, you can do your research work much faster. You can get your papers published uh, and generally, you know, be more effective as a researcher. So this is why we are doing all this stuff, basically to save uh, time. All right. Uh, so what types of problems can parallel computing be used for? Uh, there is a term which is called embarrassingly parallel problems. So these are problems which can be broken down into lots of small, small pieces. Uh, and this was a term which was originally co uh, coined by Cleve Muller. So he, he's the person who created the first version of MATLAB, in, you know, back in the 1980s or whatever it was. So examples of this would be if you have, let's say, partial differential equations and you have a mesh based solution. So there are lots of different points and you need to compute the solution for each point. That is an embarrassingly parallel problem. So that can be solved. Uh, using parallel computing, you can break down the mesh into small, small pieces. Give each piece to a core. It will solve the problem. You stitch it back together. Uh, your HPC is basically solved your problem faster. Same thing, independent simulations. So if you, if your simulations don't depend on each other. And you want to just uh, get through them faster. You can give each simulation to a different worker. Workers will crunch through it. 
uh, and you will get your data back. Uh, by simulations, we also mean, uh, you know, it can also be image data or it can also be signal data. So if you want to apply the same image processing algorithm to 10 million images, parallel computing is a very good option because the solution of one image doesn't depend on another image. It's they're independent uh, of each other. Uh, also, like uh, things like discrete Fourier transform. So DFTs, if you have each harmonic being calculated independently, you can parallelize that also. Uh, again, this is not always perfect, but uh, depends on the application. Okay. Uh, I'd like to kind of pause at this point and just learn. Uh, I mean, what kinds of problem are you working on, and do you know if it can be parallelized uh, at this point? So I hope people are following so far. So what kinds of problems are you working on? Uh, can I see? Yeah, yeah, please. The, the major uh, things that we do on MATLAB is uh, the plotting, of course, is a common thing that may not require the parallel computing. But there are some aspects uh, where we try to analyze large set of data like from global climate models or something which have multi-dimensional data so those data we have to extract and then uh, prepare the required results so that may require a lot of parallel computing so that is one thing i use right okay thanks for that yeah so definitely that will use some big data approaches as well so there are some uh, data structures in matlab which make those kinds of problems much easier to solve so i'll talk more about those uh, in a little while and uh, considering the image processing applications, uh, the people yes. and the research scholars, they work on mostly the image classification models and clustering mm -hmm. models and video processing also for object right. recognition and classification and all. So where mm -hmm. I think uh, parallel computing is much uh, important in those applications, right? Because yes, you have yes. thousands of thousands of records and images. Yes. So obviously you can, as you said, each image have different features to be extracted and all. So in ter when I consider deep learning, obviously every image features yes. need you have to be considered and you will be considering in deep learning. So I think we can use parallel computing is required in that have most yes. probably. So if we can get such solution from your end, how to do the parallel computing for image types of applications and videos as mm. well, then that will yeah. be helping our most of our students in the Institute. Okay. I can try to show a little of that. So, uh, with our deep learning toolbox, the GPU support is actually enabled by default. So if you just yeah. have a GPU, you do image classification, it will do it automatically. You don't even need to write code for it. But that students are most of the researchers not aware to use that also. Like they try to code okay. and they try to design the architectures. That's why we had an earlier workshop also to give an awareness of that uh, deep learning designing through the GPU uh, designer as well as manually also. So that was a previous okay. workshop was held. So, but still the students are not that confident in designing their own uh, code for that. So if you okay. could show some small example and show us how to parallelize that, then it will be a good beneficial to the students. Sure, I can show that. Yeah, I can show yeah. a couple of examples. Yes, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, right, so I'll carry on then because then we'll have lots of examples to cover. Uh, maybe we'll take some break in 15 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll do the hands-on part. Okay. So uh, at this point, you know, it is good to consider, are we in the right place to use parallel computing? Because it is not something you want to put efforts in unless it is going to give you good results. So first question to ask is, do we need to solve larger problems faster? If you don't need to do this, uh, you know, if you just need to generate some plots, uh, you don't actually need parallel computing. Uh, it, it won't make it any faster. So in that case, only proceed, you know, if the answer is yes. Second thing to ask is, have we already optimized our serial code? Uh, you know, are we using the C++ code generation if possible? So uh, 
once we have optimized this and still it is not giving us good results, then we typically proceed to parallel. Uh, and of course, the next question to ask is, can our problem actually be solved in parallel? Because if I just have to run one huge simulation, uh, it is not the kind of problem that traditionally parallel computing solves. Although in the last release of MATLAB, we have added some features that will help in doing, doing that. So the answer to all of these should be yes. And then after that, we have to ask ourselves, do we actually have access to a multi-core computer? Uh, which all of us have laptops these days. Uh, if we have access to a GPU, maybe that will be better for graphics problems, image problems, like Ma'am said. Uh, and do we have access to a cluster or AWS? So this is for scaling up to parallel server. So in your case, uh, at MNNIT, you have this cluster access there. So I guess all of these um, uh, you know, questions, the answer will be yes. Uh, and only if it is yes, you should proceed to parallel computing. Uh, one more thing I'll just mention here, uh, this just came up in the discussion anyway. So some of these toolboxes, which we know that people use a lot, uh, and then they need parallel computing. So by default, we have enabled automatic parallel support. So if you're working with image processing, uh, or statistics and machine learning or deep learning, uh, you know, for image classification, stuff like that, uh, or computer vision applications, these have uh, parallel enabled by default. So you don't actually need to do a lot of programming. It will be, it will just be a button in the app. You enable it and it will automatically start using, you know, four cores or the GPU. Uh, and, and it will by default use the parallel computing. Uh, I will show you a couple of examples of these, uh, you know, depending on how, uh, how fast we go. Uh, let me open this link. So this link here basically lists uh, which functions have parallel support and which functions have GPU support, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in finding the details, you can just go here and take a look. So if I look at the list of functions with automatic parallel support, uh, I'll just open that. <clears throat> I guess my net is a little bit slow today. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. So inside MATLAB, you can see there's a bunch of functions. We'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, still loading. There, there's a lot more than this. Okay. Let's say if I look at the deep learning toolbox, if I just want to classify an image or predict an image, uh, it will automatically use parallel computing features. Uh, or if I'm working in global optimization, uh, again, most of these algorithms support parallel by default. So genetic algorithms or Pareto search or particle swarm, all of these. Uh, optimization, again, this is probably MATLAB's one of core strengths. So solve or fmincon or least square curve fit. Uh, these are all parallelized by default. Okay. Uh, and you can just go and check this list for yourself. So if your function is already here, uh, then you won't have to spend much time doing uh, coding for parallel computing because it will just work by default. So statistics and machine learning, another big area. So if you're doing k-means uh, or even you know linear regression models uh, or SVM models, you know, these are very common things that people do. So all of these functions are parallelized by default. If you just have a lot of hardware, it will be able to use the hardware and run faster. And there's a lot more stuff here. So you can just look at it in your own time. Okay. Same thing for Simulink. A bunch of functions are supported by default. Um, you can take a look at the list, uh, especially for design optimization and code generation. All right. So having got all of that out of the way, now let's start looking at how we use power for loops actually for programming. I mean, if there is no option, if we have to parallelize, if it is not automatically enabled, we have to write our own code, what do we do? So by default, your MATLAB software runs on only one core of the computer, okay? So if you have four cores, uh, like my computer has four cores, uh, MATLAB will only use one fourth of the processing power by default. So what we want to do is we want to use the parallel computing toolbox and get all the rest of these cores also contributing to our uh, computing operations. 
Okay, so with parallel computing toolbox, we can write our code and then deploy our code on all the four cores. And it will be then able to use uh, all the hardware that's on your machine. So you have to install this toolbox, parallel computing toolbox. Uh, this just makes everything else better. So all the other toolboxes, they talk to this toolbox and they can run their code faster. Now, again, there is a lot of stuff. We will not cover all of it. So today I'm basically just going to cover uh, these three commands, not even Simulink. So, First command to know is uh, if you're just using a for loop, is the you know one short solution for parallel. If you're using a for loop, at the top level of the for loop, you just convert it to par for, which is a parallel for loop, uh, and MATLAB will start running your code in parallel. There's some tricks and tips you have to learn for doing that, but it's literally that simple. You just you know substitute par for, it works. Uh, Second thing we look at is we'll just skip this. We'll go to GPU array. So I'll show you how to use GPU arrays for accessing the hardware that you have on your PC. Uh, we'll maybe take some kind of graphics problem for doing this. Uh, and finally, at the end of the session, we'll look at batch. So this is for offloading your computations from your machine onto the cluster that you have. Uh, and you can even do this on your own PC. You know, you can take a problem. You can submit it as a batch job to your own computer. It will keep running in the background. So then you can keep doing other things uh, and your PC will just handle the computation on the back end. So MATLAB won't be frozen. Okay, so these three commands, if you don't remember anything else from today's session, just remember these three, par for, batch, and GPU array, because these are basically what most people need for parallel computing. Um, everything else is, uh, mostly for advanced use cases. We, we don't really need those. All right. So let me just cover this, then we'll take like a 10 minute break. So how does this work? Uh, suppose I have MATLAB running uh, and I have a for loop. So what happens in a for loop is, suppose I have five pieces of code, uh, sorry, I have five iterations of a for loop. Each of them will run one at a time. So for i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, i equals four, like one by one, it will run on one core. When we go to par for loops, what happens is each of these iterations gets stacked on different workers of a CPU and they get executed in parallel. So they will finish faster. Uh, now how this works is very, very simple. Suppose I, I declare an array A equals zeros of size five comma one, maybe I say B equals pi. For I equals one to five, I say A of I equals I plus B. Okay. Now you can see this operation cannot really be vectorized. So first step would be to vectorize it, but this cannot be vectorized because depending on the index, we want to add the value. So we have to use a for loop. But at the same time, you can do these operations in parallel because each index doesn't depend upon any other index. So what we do is we simply take this for and we replace this with par for. So we say a equals zeros, blah, blah, blah. Everything else is same. Just instead of for, I substitute par for. And what will happen is this line of code will get executed in parallel on as many cores as you have. Now, of course, this is a very, very simple piece of code, but suppose you had some big operation here in the middle. So instead of wait, your CPU waiting to finish one, then the next, then the next, then the next, all of your CPU cores can be spinning and they can be busy solving uh, multiple problems at the same time. So this is how par for works. Um, I think there's a little animation here. So suppose that you only have three workers and you have 10 jobs. What will it look like? So when we call the power for loop, uh, each set of jobs will be, you know, it will be broken up and sent to the workers. Now, whenever one set of worker is free, having finished some jobs, the next set of jobs will be transmitted. Uh, and like this, they will carry on finishing these tasks uh, until, you know, everything is done. So this way you can even have more tasks than there are workers and MATLAB will handle the, you know, the, uh, how to split the tasks automatically if we try to balance it.
okay uh, let's take a break and then we'll come back in 10 minutes and then talk about the rest um, are there any doubts so far at this point uh, just one query uh, Dhruv. yes uh, can you tell me how do I verify that parallel computing toolbox is installed or not in my MATLAB version which I have installed on my machine? How do right. I check so it? If, yes. So if I open up the command window and I type this command VER ver, okay. uh, this will give me a list of all the toolboxes. So it should be somewhere in the middle parallel computing toolbox okay suppose if i haven't installed i have it, uh, installed only few tools then how do yes. i reinstall them uh, like the specified tools so either the setup can be done again okay or in the home tab uh, we have this add-ons menu so in add-ons we can go and uh, get add-ons and from there you can just search for the toolbox and install it so we need not install the complete MATLAB again, right? If I go with the option. Yeah, so in and most what? cases, this is absolutely fine. Let's say parallel computing, I'll just search here. Okay, so I can see parallel computing toolbox. So I just click okay. on it. And then uh, this will just say install if you have not installed it. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. But my personal recommendation is always install the full MATLAB because you don't know which toolbox helps where. So it will it will take a little I, more space, yes, but it will just be faster. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. So let's get back in, I guess, 10 minutes or so. Uh, Deepshika, if you can share the attendance form, please, that would be really good if you're still there. That's good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, I'll also get some tea or coffee or something.
um hi everyone so quickly put in the uh, attendance form in the chat option so you can fill it out that we did you
Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, can we get back to the session, please? So uh, one thing, if you look at the chat menu, uh, my colleague Deepshika has shared an attendance form, uh, which will look like this. So if you click on the link that has been shared, uh, just hit continue here. Uh, you can put in your name, role number, email address, uh, and this uh, copy of this will go to Rajita, ma'am. So, ma'am, I hope that is okay. That will be fine, Dhruv. Uh, okay, ma'am. Yeah, so, uh, participants, please fill this out. And I see there are 63 people on the call now. So, I think most people are here. So, if there are faculty members, instead of roll number, you might you can type your employee ID there for the faculty members. Okay, uh, I think everyone should have gotten back now. So, let's go a little more to the hands-on side because we've been talking for a while. Uh, sorry about some background noise on my side, some construction going on. Okay, so now if I go inside the parallel computing with MATLAB folder, uh, I hope everyone has downloaded this. So there is something known as a parallel server workshop. Okay, so this is basically a full set of tutorials which we have provided. Uh, there is not enough time to cover each and every script, but the idea is that in your own time, uh, you can follow any of these given applications. So if you want to learn parallel computing, the first one. If you want to learn batch submission, the second folder contains the demo scripts. Third folder talks about big data, uh, how to handle large files and things like this. Fourth one is on GPU computing and then Simulink. So whichever your interest area is, after this session, you can still go into these folders and you can do these uh, exercises for yourself. So each of these folders, uh, they contain uh, basically a file with, with an exercise, and then there is a solution file as well. So you can do the exercise and then look at the solution. So it's almost like a full course on parallel computing with MATLAB here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the workshop. Uh, I run this workshop file. It will check that the parallel computing toolbox is installed, and it will just add it to your uh, path. So you can open it up. Okay. So parallel computing with MATLAB, parallel server workshop, and then start workshop.m. Uh, and you should be able to see the parallel computing toolbox is installed. So now let's go over a few features and uh, figure out how to use par for loops. Uh, and then depending on the time, I might show the GPU computing first or go straight to the clusters. Uh, we'll see how to how to go from there. Okay, so in this workshop, basically the first few things that we teach is how to start up, start up a pool, okay? And uh, how to get access to all the parallel computing uh, facilities that we have. So there are three basic ways of doing it. Uh, inside the 01 folder uh, in the power pool intro file, you will find these methods. So, the first way to start up a pool is uh, if this is your MATLAB screen, you go to the bottom left hand side and you click on this button with the four bars. And from here, you can say start parallel pool. So if I click on start parallel pool, uh, there will be a little pop up and MATLAB will begin starting up all of the cores on my computer. Uh, oh, oops, this is actually going to my test cluster. I'll have to shut this down and do it manually. Yeah. Uh, so first thing I want to do is on my MATLAB, uh, in the home ribbon, in the environment section, there's this parallel button. So I'm going to select my default cluster as the local cluster. This is my machine, which I'm using right now. So on the local cluster, uh, I should be able to start up this pool. Later on, we'll see how to go to the remote cluster as well. Local cluster simply means your computer. Okay, so this thing is starting up. It takes a couple of seconds the first time. 
when this starts up, it will tell us how many cores we have on our uh, laptop or on our machine, and then we will be able to use them also. Yeah, if there's any questions, just let me know. So, yeah, the first time it takes a little while, but uh, after it starts up, you don't have to do this again and again. You just need to do this once. Uh, what I will do is I'll turn off my video as well, because uh, that will save some bandwidth and free up another core for me. Okay, so after this has started up, you will be able to see parallel pool on local has been running for less than a minute, blah, blah, blah. It will shut down if it is idle in 30 minutes. And the number of workers is four. So basically what this means is on my local computer, I have four workers, which I can use. So basically four different MATLAB tasks can run on the same time because that's how many CPUs there are. Uh, if I want to do this in a programmatic fashion, uh, I can type this command which is called GCP. So GCP stands for get current pool. And if I type GCP, uh, it will return a variable which contains my process pool. It will say I am connected. I have four workers and this is the name of my cluster. So sometimes what happens is you're not sure which cluster you're connected to or how many workers you have. So by using this GCP command, it will tell you how many workers you have. Okay, uh, there's a question. What is the use of signal processing toolbox? Uh, it's in the name, so it's for processing signals. Um, if you have data coming in from anywhere, you want to, you know, resample it, uh, filter it, etc. That that's what it's for. Uh, it's not really relevant to this exact session. Your voice was not audible for the last two minutes, Dhruv. Uh, is it audible now? Yeah, now you're audible. For the earlier two minutes, your voice yeah, was not sure. audible. Oh, the entire thing about the pool was missed. Then I guess. Uh, I could hear you well, Dhruv. So I'm I'm not sure if it's a universal thing. Okay, if others can hear that, it's fine. It's okay. Uh, okay, it should be recorded anyway, so no one will miss. So I'll just repeat quickly. Uh, so there are two ways, or you know, multiple ways to start up a pool. But the two common ways are, one thing we can just go down here, bottom left hand side. There's a button. And we can start the pool from there. Or if we want to do it programmatically, we can type this command GCP. This stands for get current pool. So this will give me a variable with the name of the cluster and how many workers I have available. Okay. Now, if I want to shut down this cluster, uh, I mean, release all these workers, I can type something like, you know, uh, oops, uh, I can say delete open bracket GCP. And this will close the pool and this will actually free up the workers. Okay, so if I type delete GCP, the local uh, pool shuts down and those workers are then released. They can go on and do some other job. Uh, another way of doing it is I can request a specific number of workers. So if I don't want four workers, let's say I only want two workers. I can say power pool open bracket two. And this will open up a pool on the same profile, but this time it will get me only two workers. So this way I can select exactly how many workers I want. Uh, on your local machine, it doesn't matter that much, but on the if you work on a cluster, uh, then you should be requesting only a certain number of workers. So maybe 20 or 40 or something like that. Uh, you should not be you know, getting access to all of the workers. Okay. So if I do this power pool too, uh, I can connect to these two workers and then I can use them to do my job. All right. So now let's see how power for works. So this is in the second script. It is the ML 02 power for intro script. Uh, I'm going to just open the solution file and run through it. If you want, you can do the exercise yourself. So one of the questions here is, Suppose I want to use a par for loop. How can it help me speed up anything? Uh, 
Now, what we are going to do is we are going to write tick and talk, and then we are going to declare a for loop from index of one to ten. Now, in each iteration, I'm going to pause for one second, just to simulate that you know some calculation is happening here, and then we are going to display the index of the problem that we just solved. Okay, so if I run this loop, it will be very very intuitive. Uh, basically, it's just going to write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it's going to take one second between each iteration. Okay, so that's the output I get from one to ten in a straight line, and the elapsed time is ten point one seven seconds. So ten seconds is the actual time needed for the computation. Point one seven is some uh, you know minor computational overhead which will always exist. Okay. Now suppose I want to do this with a parallel pool. So I already have this open, so I don't really need to run line eight, but I can. So I will. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the for loop with a par for loop. Now just see what happens. So when I run this code, uh, I get a burst of data. These numbers are not in the right order, and they also appear much faster. Okay, so I get one, four, two, six, three, five, eight, seven, eight, nine, eight. You know, so it's all out of order. Now the reason for this is each of these parallel for loop tasks has been given to a different core, and they can be executed in any order because they are actually independent. If I look at the time taken, it's about five point eight seconds. So it's a little more than half. Now, if I if I want to use four cores, it will go down even more. So let me shut down this pool and open up four cores. So I'm shutting down my current pool, uh, and then I'll use a power pool of four. Okay, once you're uh, in the business of using these parallel pools, they generally open and close much faster. Although you should not be closing them unless you actually need to. So I'll just wait for this to start up again. Uh, by the way, is everyone able to run this script? Uh, can you just type yes in the chat if it is working? I hope the concept is clear at least what is happening. Okay, so now I have four workers open. Let me run this piece of code again. So if I run this power for loop, this time the results are even faster. It is still out of order. And we see elapsed time is 3.4 seconds. So I would have expected 10 divided by 4 should be 2.5, but actually it is giving me 3.4. Um, can anyone tell me why it is 3.4 and not 2.5? Little bit of overhead we expect, but not this much. So why is this 3.4? Any guesses, any ideas? So some, so some of the core are busy in another task. That's why it is happening. Uh, yes, but it's a little bit more subtle than that. Okay, let me show you why. Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, but thanks for answering anyway. So what happens is, uh, let me just try drawing some lines here. So suppose I have ten lines. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. So in the first batch, I take these four tasks and I give them to my four cores. Okay, this takes how much? One second. Now, second time, when all of these are finished, I take next four and I process them. This takes how much? One second. Now, these two are left. Okay, so it doesn't matter that two of my cores must be free because when I process these two, it will take one second again. So if you add up all three of this, this will give you three seconds plus some you know minor overhead. So that is why the number is 
yeah that was a horrible handwriting but uh, three seconds plus some you know minor uh, time amount okay so that is why this is the reason why uh, maybe i hope this graph will now make sense so as you start going to higher and higher uh, values the speed up is actually a lot better because these small differences they kind of get averaged out and your processors are able to work close to 100% of the time okay, does that make sense uh someone says no i think uh, you're not able to run the script uh, i don't know what the problem is if you can tell it we can try to solve it okay so you got it okay fine so that's how par 4 works okay uh now what what are the uh, issues with par 4 loops so let's go through a few more of these exercises uh, and then we'll understand uh so let's open up the ml03 script with the solution uh, again what we are going to do is uh, we are going to run some function in serial and parallel and then compare uh, what the results look like so i think it's just uh, calculating eigenvalues for, for some large matrix it's just a computational operation so uh, i think what it's doing it's it's taking a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix and trying to get 50 eigenvalues out or something like that. Uh, I can do the same thing in parallel. If my pool is running, this should be much faster. Uh, and then I can get the how much time it took. Okay, so consistently for different types of problems, what we see is uh, parallel computing can reduce the time. So what was taking 6.4 seconds for a single processor with four processors, it's taking 2.7. So it is less than half the time. It is not quite one fourth because uh, as I explained, there will be some overheads, but the time does get reduced. So if you have large problems going to parallel can be quite helpful. Uh, and this histogram kind of shows uh, where the speedups uh, happen. Uh, Let's keep moving to the next example. So uh, the next one is more useful. It's more about syntax. Um, if I take this code that you see on screen right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sweep through a bunch of indices and I'm saying whatever my current index is, uh, I want to take the last index and add some random number. Now, what you will notice is even though this piece of code looks uh, kind of okay at first glance. If I try to run this, it will throw an error. Okay. Why will it throw an error? Because these uh, iterations of the for loop are not independent of each other. Because uh, in order to calculate this value, I need the value from the last iteration, index minus one. So what happens is I cannot actually run this in parallel. Uh, because they have to be all the calculations must be carried out in serial format because i need the results from the previous simulation to do this simulation so i can't parallelize this okay um, there are some uh, best practices on how to use par for loops and basically what we do is the highest level uh, for loop that you have only that you put inside par for and you make sure that the uh, different iterations are independent of each other. Okay. Uh, so the next script basically shows this. If I want to solve this kind of problem, what should I do? Uh, sorry for this bad image here. Now, Suppose I have this kind of problem. Let me just talk through this because everything is labeled here. I declare some variables in the beginning. Uh, I call a par for loop and then I do some assignments and things like this. So the first thing you will notice is the par for loop must be the outermost loop. Uh, if you have multiple for loops, you cannot have all of them par for. 
So let's say you have four i from this to this, four j from this to this, four, four k from this to this. Only one level of the loop can be parallelized and ideally it should be the highest level because that's how you get the most speed up. <coughs> okay, so you can't put a par four inside a par four because it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, another thing is what kinds of variables can we access? So if I have uh, a random array of numbers, I can basically access any of them inside a, a, a you know a par for loop. But if I had to access uh, any, if I had to access any variable that is being changed by any other iteration of the loop, that will not give me the correct results because you don't know what order the par for loops are being executed in. Okay. So uh, these are some things to keep in mind uh, that all of the simulations that you're doing, all of the iterations that you're doing, they have to be completely independent of each other. Uh, you cannot just keep on changing the numbers between uh, various loops. Uh, the only exception to this might be some kind of, uh, you know, counting variable, uh, which is uh, like a broadcast variable. Uh, this usually confuses people a bit, but uh, when you start doing parallel computing, you will kind of understand. Uh, the main idea here is all of the iterations must be independent. You cannot access data from any other iteration of the for loop. Uh, if you open the ML07 file, this is the par for nested solution. Uh, what this will show you is what is possible and what is not possible in terms of multiple for loops uh, being used together. So let's say that I'm taking some uh, large matrices and I'm trying to multiply them together. Uh, so I have a top level for loop that runs from one to 500. And then I have a for loop inside that that runs from one to 100. And then I'm just doing some matrix operations. So what I will do in that case is the highest level loop, I will convert to a power four and inside it, I can keep more for loops. Other option I can do is the top level loop I can keep as a power four and the inside one I can keep as a, sorry, the top level I, I can keep as four and inside one I can keep as a power four. What you will notice here is if I run the second solution, uh, it will actually take a lot more time to complete. The reason is because the highest level loop always has the most number of simulations or generally has the most number of uh, simulations or iterations to complete. So par four should uh, usually be on the outermost level. And if you put par four multiple times, it will always throw an error. You have to finish an entire iteration chain and then go on to the next one. So in this case, it will take almost like 30, 40 seconds, something like that. Okay. So you can see it's basically the same process that we are doing. If I put par four on the outside, it takes less than one second because I'm running through 500 iterations on four cores. Uh, if I put par four on the inside, uh, it is basically taking much longer, almost hundred times longer because it was the highest level that I should have put it on. Uh, it has the most number of iterations to complete. Okay. So these are some of the common pitfalls. Uh, basically, uh, these are just best practices that you should be doing. Uh, again, you can also take another uh, for function and you can just nest it inside a local function as well. So you can just have one par for and then you can call some local function which has uh, different for loops inside it. And the way to do that is shown here. I'm not going into the details right now because there's just a lot of stuff to cover. Okay. Uh, what I would like to uh, hear at this point from the audience is, are you following what a par for loop is? And can you see how you would use it in your own exercises? Uh, because that's actually the valuable part. I can I can show you lots of these examples, but uh, you should get it at the end of the day.
so uh, has anyone spotted any place where you know you can use a power for loop uh, and if you'd like to discuss it just let me know are the scripts working for everyone can you just type yes or no in the chat uh, i hope the script should be fine because i've tested uh, all of them okay scripts are working okay uh, right so basically uh, what i would like you to do is in your own time after the session go through these exercises uh, it will show you how to load and save different files uh, how to work with structures how to do a parameter sweep, uh, how to plot different things. So it will show you various ways of using parallel computing. And once you know how to use these properly, then you can you know, start applying them in your exercises or uh, in your problems. So let me get back to the seminar and we'll move forward a little bit. So one of these applications uh, kind of things can be, uh, I'll just show you the video of this, the demo files are in the folder as well. Suppose I want to perform a parameter sweep. Okay, so I have some X, Y values and I want to do some computation. Uh, if I wanted to do it in a serial fashion, what you are seeing on this graph is one by one, the points are being updated. So the points come in one at a time uh, because one solution is being computed at one time. And uh, this entire process will take a uh, you know, few seconds to finish, maybe 30 or 40 seconds. This is for a 25 uh, grid size, so five by five matrix. Okay, so it takes 38 seconds to do this kind of computation. This is in the demos folder, by the way, in the sweep van der Paul. Now, suppose you just change the for loop to a par for loop instead of calculating one value at one time, uh, you can calculate four and the time just drops from, you know, 30 something seconds to 11 seconds. Let me show that again. So on a serial mode, if I was trying to calculate solutions for some X and Y parameters, uh, we basically go one by one. So these values come in one at a time. Uh, suppose I want to scale up and use a par for, I just substitute the for with a par for. And uh, what will happen is four values are computed at the same time because I have a, a four CPU cluster. And then this thing just fills out much more rapidly. So you go down from 38 seconds to 11 seconds, the, the computation time. If you want to try this yourself, uh, what we can do is we can go back to MATLAB. Uh, come out of the parallel computing, uh, sorry, parallel server workshop folder, go to demos. And inside demos, there is this live script called sweep underscore van der Paul. Okay, so all the code I'm showing today, it has already been shared with you in the files. So in the demos folder, sweep van der Paul, uh, you can try this for yourself. So this is for the, this is for something known as a van der Paul oscillator. Uh, this is just an ordinary differential equation where we are changing two parameters. And what we can do is uh, we can just, uh, you know, use parallel computing to calculate the results much, much more quickly. So this code structure we find for many people is very useful. You can take your problem uh, and you can start generating plots like this. I'm not talking through each of the commands because you can read up on those afterwards. I just wanted to show you how it can used to speed up your applications. Now suppose I'll go to a larger grid size, maybe 10 by 10, uh, then parallel computing is definitely needed because otherwise we'd be sitting here for half an hour just waiting for the results to come in. So you can take large grids and then you can uh, get the results of all the data very quickly. When we scale up to a cluster, I'll show you how to do this with multiple workers, uh, more than four, I mean. Okay, so you can keep on running this in the background. Now, uh, let's talk about a few more things. So what 
governs the speed up that you get from power for loops. So one thing is if the computation time is too short, you will not get much speed up because the single job just takes a very short time. Uh, if you have RAM limitations or file access limitations, so if your RAM uh, is too less or your hard drive is too slow, then the speed does not depend on your CPU. Then it will depend on those components which are in a shorter supply. So that may also slow down the power for loops, uh, especially if you're reading a lot of, you know, image files from a rotating hard drive, from a disk hard drive. Uh, so if you switch to a solid state disk SSD, then you will get a, you know, faster uh, processing time, even though the same CPU is there. Uh, also implicit multi-threading. So some functions I mentioned, they already are parallelized by default. So for them, you don't need to use power for because it won't help. So in that case, uh, just use the function directly. No need to write your own power for loop. And finally, sometimes uh, there might be unbalanced load. So when you have multiple threads on a CPU, sometimes one particular task might end up taking a disproportionately large time for whatever reason. So in that case, that one processor might be taking you know 20 minutes and the rest of the jobs are finished. So this is something that uh, comes with practice. You know, we learn how to identify uh, what kinds of problems might be tough and then maybe solve those uh, separately. Uh, so these are basically some of the factors uh, of, the, you know, that will determine how much of a speed up you get. Uh, but at least, you know, if you, even if you're on a normal machine, two times, three times, four times is very easy. And when you go up to a cluster, you can be using 50 cores or 100 cores. Uh, then your speed ups will be larger and larger. Another thing that happens is if your cluster is far away, uh, you might have some latency because you need to submit a job. The job will get queued up and then it will take time to get the data back. Good evening, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, was there a question? Okay, random greeting. <laughs> Uh, the simulink part, I'm not covering today because I don't think there are many simulink users here, but just let me summarize what we have discussed so far. So if you want to get the most out of MATLAB on one machine, uh, first thing, use the latest version of MATLAB, uh, follow the best practices we talked about, uh, use the built-in functions, which uh, have parallel enabled by default. Okay. Uh, this one is more advanced, uh, but basically you can use par for loops to use uh, multi-core CPUs in a more customized way. Uh, and then the GPU access, you can also use GPU arrays uh, to access the individual cores of your GPU and then use uh, those in parallel. So I think what I'll do is I'll show you batch commands and then I'll come back to the GPU because that's a different kind of workflow. Uh, let me skip ahead a bit. Okay. So, uh, let me talk a little bit about the clusters just to make sure we are on the same page. Um, I'll tell you what batch commands are and how to submit batch commands, uh, because then after this session, you will be ready to use the cluster. Uh, and then whoever is interested, we can stay behind for extra half hour just to talk about the GPU case. Okay. I hope that that's okay. Uh, so basically if you've figured out how to use power for loops, you're basically good with using your desktop machine or your laptop. Uh, and especially all the cores on your CPU plus the GPU. So all of this is com covered by the parallel computing toolbox. Now, suppose you want to go and scale up to a cluster. Uh, this will require another thing, which is known as MATLAB parallel server. So this has already been installed on the big machine that's in your campus. So you don't have to do anything uh, right this instant. You just have to learn how to submit jobs onto that cluster. And there are some concepts we have to cover uh, as to what is a job, how do you submit it, how do you use batch commands, and how do you, you know, retrieve your results after the job has been done. So this is what we'll cover in this uh, kind of 
uh, second half of the session, if you like. Okay, so what is the concept? Uh, the concept with parallel computing is first thing you should do is you should prototype your algorithm on the desktop. So you should take a small piece of your problem. Let's say 10 iterations, 20 iterations, whatever it is, and make sure the code is basically working on your desktop machine. Why? Because there is no cost. It's just in front of you. Uh, you can spend time and make sure your algorithm is doing the right thing. Now, suppose you have to run parameter sweeps or process data, which is hundreds of times larger, thousands of times larger. So then what we do is we scale up to the cluster. Okay. Uh, so we take our uh, code and we submit a job using the same code to the cluster and all of the hardware or, you know, much of the hardware of that cluster will then be used to solve your specific problem. Uh, if it is set up properly, uh, I think in your case, you will have some profiles, which we will share with you afterwards. Uh, the advantage is you will not need to go into the Linux system and uh, write bash scripts or anything like that. You get to stay in your nice clean MATLAB interface. Uh, and there is a very simple way of just submitting jobs to the cluster. So you don't have to get into the, you know, nitty gritties of the, uh, IT part of it. Uh, if it is just a regular computation, you can just use the cluster straight away. So I, I hope that sounds good. Uh, can I just see how many participants here, uh, you're interested specifically in this part of it. So, uh, please write cluster if you want to see this and please write GPU if you want to see the other half of this. Because I just want to get an idea of, uh, who is in the audience. So can you write in the chat, please? So cluster versus uh, GPU. Okay, look, there are 44 people in the call, two comments like this is, I'm also spending my time talking to you, right? So you guys need to be interactive because then later on you'll send me email saying, sir, you did not teach this, did not teach that. Okay, so some people in, are interested in both, uh, one GPU, one cluster. Both, okay. Okay, so most people are interested in both. Okay, so I'll take an extra half hour after 4.30 uh, and we'll look at both of them, okay? Clusters and GPUs. Uh, and then later on, if, if you get stuck somewhere, you just send me an email. All right, so uh, how do clusters work? Uh, let me skip a little bit ahead. Yeah. So the way clusters work, uh, are through something known as batch jobs. Okay. So on your computer, you just have four cores, but on a cluster, they have something like 200 cores or 400 cores. I don't know what the configuration is. Uh, now the way a cluster is configured is they have something known as a scheduler. So what a scheduler uh, allows is multiple people can submit jobs to the cluster. So it's such that, you know, if you just have one small job that needs 20 cores, you will not go and block the entire resource of the high performance computing center, right? So what you do is you submit a job that tells the scheduler that, Hey, I need 20 cores and uh, my job will take, you know, three hours, maybe roughly speaking. So please allocate me this much resources. Another user comes in and says, Hey, I need hundred cores and my job will probably take, you know, something like a day. So terminate it after one day. Uh, Another user comes in says, uh, I need 50 cores. So like this, what the scheduler software on the cluster will do is it will take all the jobs. It will put them in a queue. Queue is like a line, right? And as the resources free up, the jobs will be assigned to the workers uh, and it will move down the list and your job will be processed. So what you do is you're sitting at your computer. You submit a batch job to the cluster. The cluster will take some time. It will finish processing the job. Uh, maybe, you know, it, it might take a couple of minutes. It might take half a day. It might take a week, depends on how busy it is. And after this is processed, then what you do is you retrieve the results onto your computer and you basically see it. Okay. Is this, uh, method kind of clear? I'll look at the commands in a bit. Any doubts on this? 
on, on what these words mean. No? Okay. All right. Uh, so what we want to see is how do we actually submit batch jobs from our client computer onto the cluster? Uh, and if your profiles are properly uh, set up, uh, I'll show you how to you know do a little bit of that. So if your profiles are properly set up, then it's literally just like a one line command. So you say job equals batch, put in the name of your script or function, and then you can say pool and list the number of workers that you need. Okay, and this work number of workers will actually be n minus one because one of the workers is needed to uh, manage the all the other workers. So let's say that I have a job called my script, and I want forty workers. So I would say job one, job number one equals batch, my script, pool comma thirty nine. So it will assign me forty on that other side because 39 actual workers and one for managing them. So like this, what will happen is all the files that are required for my job, you know, my script, my data files, everything, it will get uh, packaged into, you know, uh, one single file and transmitted over the internet to the cluster. Now on the cluster side, MATLAB is already installed, so it will unpack it. It will send the jobs out to all of the workers when everything is processed, it will pack it up again and keep it ready for me. So then I can go anytime I want. Uh, I will say, is my job finished? It will reply yes. So then I pick it up, bring it back, open it my end, and then I can look at the results. Okay, so if we understand this batch workflow, uh, then things get very, very easy. So how do we actually do this? Uh, let me show you. It's actually easier to show you than tell you. Okay, uh, let me clear my stuff. So, first thing we have to do is we have to make sure we are selecting the right cluster. So in the environment tab, uh, in the home ribbon, if you go to this parallel menu, uh, there is an option saying select a default cluster. So you can select a local cluster, which is your machine, uh, or some other cluster. So I have this CPU test cluster which is running on Amazon Web Services. Uh, I actually turned it on in the break. So this cluster is online uh, and it has 18 cores that I can use, 18 workers. Okay, uh, it has a head node and some uh, head node is one machine that manages the other workers. Uh, and then it has 18 CPU cores inside of it. Uh, the way your cluster works is slightly different, but the process will be very similar. So if you can understand the concept, then we'll be able to make it make the connection. Okay. So first thing what I want to do is I just want to test some script with my local cluster. How do I actually submit a job? So suppose that uh, I have uh, this script. This is basically a parallel benchmark script. Uh, actually, let me let me take something simpler than this even. Just give me one second. Or it's using the same function. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. I'm trying to select which is the right demo to show you because there are multiple ones in here. Okay, yeah, let's look at this one. So inside the parallel server workshop folder, if you can go back to this, there is a folder called 02 batch submission. Okay. So if you just go to that one, uh, then we can open the ML01 file, uh, which is the ML01 batch intro. Now, what is happening inside this file is the uh, first thing we are going to add some required files. Uh, okay. okay. So the required files are already added. So what the required files contain is some MATLAB scripts, which are there. Uh, the same parameter sweep scripts that we were using before. So there is one serial option and one parallel option. Now, what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to create a job 
uh, and then I'm going to uh, submit it as a batch job to my local cluster. Okay, so first let me submit a serial job uh, and then I will submit a parallel job after that. So for this particular function that I'm using, it's called X underscore serial. Uh, if I open X serial, what we see is this function just needs uh, two numbers here. So M is the number of rows and columns of some matrix and N is the number of trials. So basically it just takes in a big matrix, calculates the eigenvalues, uh, and then you get the output of how much time it was spent to do that operation. So it's just like solving a big system of equations. So for this job, uh, I just want to submit this function with this many outputs, so it's 10,000 outputs, uh, sorry, inputs, uh, and just one output. So let me submit this once. Um, it will make sense once I've shown it once because the, all the things will make sense. I actually need to close the parallel pool. So once I submit this job, uh, it will enter the queue of my local machine. Let me try this once more. So when I uh, when I use the batch command, this job one, which is basically calling this script, will get submitted to the queue of tasks that have to be executed on my computer. So how can I see this? Uh, if I go to the home tab, I go to parallel, and then I open this one, monitor jobs. Uh, what we will see here is that on uh, you know Tuesday, November 23rd, which is today, 1624, which is right now, I submitted a job which is running. This is running a function. And after this job, there is another one queued. So what I've submitted right now is a script, which is a serial script. So this is using only one core and I have submitted two of these jobs. So out of the four cores of my computer, one is running MATLAB. Another one is solving this job in the background. Another third core is solving this job in the background and they're all kind of running at the same time. Now, if I update this now, I think one of them might be finished. Okay, both are finished now. <clears throat> so what this job monitor enables is uh, whatever jobs you have submitted to the cluster, you can just see the status there. So when did you submit them? When did you finish them? Uh, this tasks basically means how many workers. So I just requested one because it's a serial job. And then what is the state? So is it finished or is it running? Uh, if there are errors, then it will tell you what the errors are. And if there are warnings, you will also you know, get the warnings back. So I submitted a batch job to my own machine. It is now finished. How do I get the results back? So the way to get the results back is, uh, Oh yeah, sorry, I have to go back into the job monitor. Uh, suppose I take this job, I can right click and I can say fetch outputs. Okay, you can do this in code or by clicking. So if I say fetch outputs, uh, what you will see is inside my workspace, uh, this job basically has returned some outputs. Let me clear this and I will just fetch them again because there's too much stuff here. So right now you can see my workspace is empty. I just want to get the outputs from this job. So I right click and I hit fetch outputs. So when this job is finished, yeah, now you can see the results properly. Uh, this particular code is called, it says job for output equals fetch outputs of job number four. So the ID is number four because uh, it was just the fourth one I submitted today. And the output I can see is a one by one cell array. It just contains 10 different values. So if I open up, open up this one, uh, this will basically contain the eigenvalues of the calculation that I was doing. So it will just be a vector. 
So these are the results of you know whatever calculation I was doing. Now I can take them, I can plot them, I can save them in a file, whatever I want to do. Okay. Uh, now suppose I want to submit uh, a, a job that requires multiple cores. How can I do that? So for that, there is another script that we have here. Uh, let me first clear this stuff. So there is another script which is called ex underscore parallel. If I open this up, what this will show me is uh, in this case, again, we are taking m by n uh, values. So m by m matrix size and n number of trials. But instead of a for loop, we are using a par for loop. So if this particular function, if I pass this as a job, what will happen is on the cluster side, multiple cores will be used in the same job. So this is what we actually want to do. I want to submit a job and on the cluster side, you know, 30, 40, 50 cores should be used to perform all of these calculations. So the way to do this is inside the function, we will be using par for. Okay. If there are any doubts after the session, you can come back and open these files yourself and just read, uh, because doing it yourself is, is actually much better. Uh, you will understand it much better. Now in the batch command syntax, there's a little bit of a change. So I'm still going to say job two equals batch open bracket. This is the function number of outputs inputs. All this stuff is the same, but I will have to add two more things here at the end. So I will say pool and then I will request how many number of workers I want minus one. So suppose I want to do this with four workers. I'll just change the code here to say four. Uh, I will ask for three workers in the pool and plus one will be allocated automatically for managing those three. Okay. So if I want to submit a parallel computation, this is the syntax. I just run this piece of code. Uh, when this job is successfully submitted, I will get uh, I will basically be able to uh, get an output message and then I can check what is the state of the job. So if I just type job to state, it will say it is running. Uh, I can either keep checking again and again, or I can just wait for job two to finish. So if I call this command on line 12, my MATLAB is just going to wait until the job I had submitted finishes running and then it will tell me it's finished. I hope all this stuff is kind of making sense in you know, a job submissions batch. Uh, the best thing for you all to do would be to open up this uh, same file and do this hands-on along with me if you're not already doing it, uh, because then you'll be able to see the outputs and it kind of makes sense then. Okay. So now my job is finished and the job to state says finished. So I know this finished running, no problems, no errors. Now I can again, you know, fetch the outputs back. Uh, they will be in my workspace. So I think it's results two. Uh, and these are the results that I get from the parallel computation. Okay. So like this with the batch job submission, I can take a task submit it to the cluster and then when it's finished i can get the results back so what are the advantages of submitting uh, batch jobs over using pools so number one thing is if you're using a remote cluster you can't actually use a parallel pool. You can't directly call par4 uh, because your remote cluster won't give you the permission. So that is why it is necessary to understand batch jobs because only inside a function can you request a certain number of uh, workers and the scheduler will assign only that many workers to you. So on your local PC, you can always use a parallel pool, but on the remote cluster that you guys are using, 
uh, you will never be able to use a parallel pool pretty much. You will have to use batch jobs. So that is why the understanding the batch commands is necessary. Uh, there are some additional advantages. So when we are using a pool, we can only run one pool at a time. I can have a pool of two or a pool of four or a pool of six on my computer. I can only have one of those. But for the batch jobs, you can queue up multiple jobs on the same computer, whether it's your own computer or HPC. So you can have different kinds of jobs all queued up and they will just wait in the background. Uh, now, suppose that you have a lot of jobs, you have submitted them to the cluster. Uh, you can even close down MATLAB on your PC uh, and you can even shut down your computer because it will keep running on that uh, cluster that you have. Now, uh, multiple of those will also wait in the background. So, you know, suppose you're sitting in your laboratory, you submit a bunch of jobs, then you have to go to class. So you shut down your laptop, take it with you. And when you get back in the evening, you can open it up again and you can retrieve the results of the job because they will, the results will just sit on the cluster uh, while the job is you know waiting to be finished. So basically it frees up your computer for doing other stuff. And uh, the place where you should be using this, sorry about the screen here. Uh, if you're working on a cluster or you have very long running jobs, these should be submitted as batch jobs. Uh, and this will basically free up your PC to do other stuff and, and you can do lots of computation. Okay, please tell me your doubts because I'm sure there must be doubts. Uh, no one understands this in the first time. So have people tried running this script? Uh, the batch intro one, is it running properly? Yes, no. Okay, so one person is able to run this at least. Okay. Right, uh, let me show you the cluster side of it in two minutes and then we'll kind of put the whole story together. So right now what we were doing is uh, we were just submitting batch jobs on our local computer just to test out the code is working. But now what if I want to submit jobs to a remote cluster, which is the HPC. So what happens is you will need to get something known as a cluster profile uh, from your computer center. So we'll work with MAM and uh, we'll try to share the instructions with you. Uh, for now, what I'm showing is uh, I'm showing this on my own system, uh, on my own Amazon account. So there is one cluster which is running in Tokyo. Uh, and it has 18 workers. Uh, I have access to this because I set up a profile. Uh, now, how do you get this profile? So if you go to the parallel menu, there will be a button that says create and manage clusters. Okay. Now inside create and manage clusters, what we will need to do is we will need to add a cluster profile. So uh, basically this can be using uh, MATLAB job scheduler or other third party schedulers. Uh, I'm not sure which one is running on your system. It's not MATLAB job scheduler. It, it will be probably something like Slurm or PBS. Uh, these are different kinds of schedulers which run on high performance computing machines. Uh, you will not do the setup yourself. What you will do is you will just click on import uh, and someone will probably give you a file that you just click on the file, you click open and a cluster profile will be added. So uh, I'll just show you the example for my own cluster profile. So in this case, uh, this is the Amazon one that I have. Uh, oh, it doesn't actually say anything much. But uh, in your case, basically what you will have is, uh, it will tell you what the license number is uh, and it will give you a range of workers which you are allowed to use. So it will say the minimum number is maybe one, maximum number is like 40 or 60 or something like that. Uh, because you will not be allowed to use all of the cores of your cluster. It, it will probably be limited by your computer center. So you will be able to request only maximum of 40 or 60 or 100, uh, something like that. Uh, it depends on what configuration is shared with you. Okay. Uh, now, once you have the cluster profile imported, 
uh, what you will do is you will go and click on this button validate. So this will just double check that uh, you are able to work with the cluster and submit jobs and get results. So let me do this with my Amazon cluster. So I click validate. It will run some tests automatically. So the first thing is the uh, cluster connection test. Okay, apparently I'm unable to connect because I'm running the last version. Uh, I'll have to set up a new cluster for myself. Uh, I'll just create one straight away. Uh, no need to take too much time. Uh, I, I can just create it with, if from inside MATLAB itself. If, if for Amazon, it's very, very easy. So it takes a little bit of time to set it up the first time, but I just wanted to show you the speed ups. So uh, I'll just set this up and then take any doubts and then we'll show you how to submit a job. Uh, sorry, I should have checked this before. So the process on a remote cluster is exactly the same. If you can submit bad jobs to your local PC, uh, the remote PC side is exactly the same process. I mean, it's just using literally the same commands. Okay, uh, well, it's up now. So let's say PC test. Uh, let's book it for two hours, blah, blah, blah. I'll get 16 workers. Uh, so what is happening right now is I'm actually creating a cluster for me to use um, on the Amazon platform. So this will take around five minutes to start up. Uh, meanwhile, let me just cover again and you know what the batch commands are doing for us. So this will just wait to finish. Okay, so uh, the way this process works is we open the parallel menu. Uh, we select the profile that we have to use. So instead of the local profile, we select the other cluster that we are using. Uh, and you can, you know, get what your jobs are doing. So basically what we do is we submit the jobs using the same batch command. We check if the process is finished. And after that, we can, uh, uh, you know, do post processing. So you can plot it or save the data or whatever you want to do. Uh, to submit the jobs to a given cluster, there's a certain syntax again, uh, which looks like this. So uh, instead of saying power pool on your cluster, you can say, uh, you can specify which particular cluster you want to use for the batch jobs. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit hard to explain on the webinar. What I'll do is uh, I'll try to send you some documentation on this. So you'll be able to follow the steps um, you know, one by one in, in lines of code. Uh, this stuff is actually much easier to show in person, but because of COVID, we're not allowed to travel. So otherwise I would have just shown you this uh, running on my machine. Okay, so once your cluster is up, you've submitted a job. Once the job is finished, uh, what we do is we use this command fetch outputs to get the outputs of the job. It is typically a cell array. So we extract the numbers from that array uh and and you know you can do whatever output you uh, you know processing you want on that uh, and then you can delete the job when you're finished so that will just free up the space on that cluster uh let's see if this has started up yet I'm just checking if my Amazon cluster has started up yet. Uh, if it has, I'll show you the demo. Okay, it's still starting. Okay, I'll get back to this afterwards. Uh, let me show you the GPU stuff meanwhile then, because otherwise we'll run out of time. Uh, before we get there, so so how many people understood a little bit about this kind of process here? 
can you just type yes or no if some part of that this makes sense to you so basically you have your client uh, which is your computer you have some function or some script file you use this batch command to submit a job job gets processed after it is finished then you fetch the results and then you can you know do whatever you want with it okay rajita ma'am says it's clear um does anyone have any doubts here please let me know because i can't see your faces so i can't actually tell okay i guess it's kind of clear right okay let me show you the gpu side then very quickly um uh, you want you know we'll get back to this after the cluster is online all right <clears throat> yeah sorry about the trouble uh, i did not anticipate the version mismatch okay uh right so for gpus uh, there is a little bit of a different concept compared to you know what we do with uh, our cpus uh, and the reason is basically this so typically what happens is uh, we only have a few cpu cores on our computer so we have 4 or 6 or you know 12 something like that uh gpu cores are different so gpu cores can do only very simple operations they can't execute very complex commands but there are a lot of them so if you're just doing addition subtraction multiplication gpu cores can do that uh and they can do that in a massively parallel way so there are a lot of computational cores on your gpu and they all share the same device memory so you can access uh, you know different parts of the same matrix uh using different gpu cores i mean it just works a lot more seamlessly now why should we use them so as i mentioned the number of cores on a gpu is typically a lot higher than cpus they are ideal for massively parallel problems like image processing or you know classification or pixel wise uh you know uh segmentation or you know stuff like that uh the advantage with matlab is there is a whole bunch of functions which are uh, enabled for gpus uh and it's very very easy to access your gpu memory through matlab so what you do is let's say you declare a matrix 3000 by 3000 uh, size the only thing you have to do separately is you have to transfer the data from your computer's ram into the gpu memory So the way you do this is by calling this command GPU array. So I say A two equals GPU array of A one. So this big matrix three thousand by three thousand will be transferred over to the GPU memory. Now after that, the commands that I write will be exactly the same as what I write on my CPU. So I will just say B two equals FFT of A two. Uh, which is just some function I'm running. You can do plus minus subtract blah 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 image processing. Uh, and when you are finished doing all of your calculations then what you say is you use this command gather open bracket on the same variable so what this will do is it will take back the results of the calculations from all those cpu cores uh, gpu cores uh, and it will bring it back to your computer memory so then you can use the results which are stored inside this array okay so uh, basically it's very easy to use you just have to know gpu array and gather if you know these two commands uh you can start using your gpu memory to do simple operations okay uh let me show you a demo of how fast it can be so this is solving the wave equation uh wave equation is a second order uh pde now if i run this on a cpu it might take you know 13000 seconds on a gpu it's like 1800 seconds so it's much faster and uh, the advantage of a gpu is if you make the grid size larger and larger uh the problem becomes even more massively parallelized so the performance actually keeps on increasing with larger grid sizes uh this demo if you want to run this yourself uh it is inside the gpu wave equation demo but i actually want to show you a different one uh which is the 
uh, which is this one. But before that, how do you know if you actually have a supported GPU? So you have to go into the command window of MATLAB and just type this command. It's called GPU device. I'll paste it in the chat as well. Uh, and if this command gives you an output, then you know you have a GPU on your system which you can use. So right now only NVIDIA GPUs are supported. Uh, we have a partnership with them. That's why uh, we, you know, we release the drivers and lockstep with our releases, uh, or rather, you know, uh, our releases work with their latest drivers. Uh, if you have this number, this number is the compute capability. So if this is greater than 3.2, uh, then your GPU is basically good enough to do deep learning. Yeah, was there a question? Okay, so uh, there are multiple ways to use uh, GPUs. I'll show you a few of them, but the things to be aware of are this compute capability. Uh, the higher this is, the better it is. Uh, and basically it will tell you how many uh, threads you basic, uh, have on your GPU. So I think I have like a thousand threads available. Uh, it will also tell you what is the maximum memory. So if you try putting matrices larger than this size uh, on the GPU, it will fail because it will run out of memory. So I think 7.4 into 10 to the power of nine bits, uh, this is how much memory I have available. I cannot use a matrix bigger than this size. So it's, uh, I think, 8 GB, uh, roughly what it is. Okay, so how do I actually use this and how much is the speed up? <clears throat> uh, how many of you know what the Mandelbrot set is? Can you just type yes or no in the chat? Uh, if you know what this is, this is a really nice treat to see. Okay, no one has seen this before? No, okay. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, yeah, just let me take a minute. Uh, it's actually easier to show you than it is to tell you. Uh, so the Mandelbrot set is basically it's like this mathematical construct. Okay. Uh, all of this complexity that you see inside this image, uh, it basically comes out of an equation which is one inch long. It's just computing. Uh, this is the complex plane and it's just computing if a certain function converges to a value in that complex plane. Now the thing about the Mandelbrot set is each of these points is basically a mathematical coordinate and we have to compute the value at each point uh, to know uh, if that mathematical function converges or not. And what you're looking at here, uh, this is actually true mathematical infinity because you can keep on zooming inside this and it will constantly keep on giving new and new features. Okay, so it's a very popular uh, concept in chaos theory uh, or uh, you know dynamic systems. So what happens is, if you start zooming inside the Mandelbrot set and computing deeper and deeper, uh, these you know really amazing patterns kind of keep emerging out of it. And if you zoom in, you, you can zoom in for infinity, it will keep on showing new and new patterns. So, uh, I mean, I find this pretty exciting. Uh, and the equation that all this comes from is basically just that. So it's F uh, C of Z equals Z squared plus C. Uh, Z is, you know, uh, basically the coordinates that you're kind of selecting here. Uh, and this is the complex plane, so it, it has some, you know, funny mathematics going on behind it. The point is you just have to solve an equation for each point on this screen. So we can do that very easily using a GPU. Uh, so let me show you how we do it. Yeah, sorry, was that a question? Okay. Uh, again, as I said, you don't really need to understand the maths behind this. You just need to understand the coding aspect of it. So if this is the entire Mandelbrot set, uh, I just want to zoom in on this part of it. Okay. 
and this is just a grid of numbers x and y coordinates i want to calculate the solutions in this region so first thing i declare is uh, i'm going to do this for 500 iterations grid size of 1000 uh, x coordinates are these y coordinates are these easy peasy uh, this is inside the gpu mandelbrot demo so you can run this for yourself if if you have a pc with a gpu now what do we do first thing we do is uh, we declare this function tic and at the end we will have toc here so this will tell us how much time it takes now inside we just declare a mesh grid uh, between the x and y coordinates that we specified okay and then we are going to run the calculations for each point in this grid so we are just going to compute uh, the value of z squared and add the uh, this z not value at each step and then we are going to decide if the absolute value converges or not uh, if it converges we basically you know mark it a certain color that's that's basically what's happening so if i run this on my cpu um uh, this operation will take around i guess 10 seconds or so uh and this is the image i get okay so for each of these points the color basically indicates uh, a certain kind of mathematical solution i'm not going into details here okay now what i want to do is i want to take all of these points and i just want to pass them to my gpu because my gpu has 2000 cores uh, or 1000 cores whatever it was and these are just simple operations i need to square the value of a pixel and then add a number so this my gpu simple cores can handle very easily so how do i do this uh basically i will use the gpu array operation so instead of declaring just a uh, linear spacing i just write gpu array dot lin space and same thing for the y coordinate i say gpu array dot lin space so i've just changed two lines of code by adding that one keyword after that everything is the same here it's exactly the same code and at the end when i have to gather the data back i just use this command gather to fetch the data back from the gpu and then i can plot everything on the screen okay so it is literally the same code that i use on the cpu but the initial memory uh, you know matrix i change to a gpu array and at the end i just gather the count back so you change this and when i run this now uh, i'll try to run it a few times and you will see the difference okay so this now runs in 2 seconds it's five times faster if i run this again and again it will actually give me faster results because my gpu is getting accessed so it's around 13 times faster uh 15 times faster so that's about how fast it gets so if you access your gpu again and again your operating system does some fancy stuff and allows you to access the memory faster so what was taking 10 seconds on your cpu takes you know less than 1 second on your gpu and this is with the simplest possible method that you can do uh there is there are more advanced methods so right now what we are doing is we are transferring only the uh only the data onto the memory of the gpu if you can also be a little bit more advanced in your programming and you transfer the entire function the the code also to your gpu uh that is shown in the next section of the code uh i will not go through the details but you can read it but when i run it you will see what happens so it's using exactly the same kind of thing but uh, when i run this uh that will get me around 100 times faster speed up it's the same problem running on the same hardware if you just program more efficiently it will get you 100 times faster uh and if you want to go even crazy you know even beyond this what you can do is you can take your matlab code convert it to cuda code i think many people here are from computer science so you might know this stuff 
Uh, I don't really know it that well, so I won't go into the details again. I just want to show you the speed up part. So if you can convert your MATLAB code into CUDA code, which is the equivalent of converting MATLAB into C code for your CPU, uh, you will get something like, yeah, like a 200% speed, 200 times speed up. So this is the power of, you know, being very, very good at programming or uh, knowing your computation because solving the same maths, solving uh, on the same hardware, uh, you have increased your speed by 200 times. Uh, to generate CUDA code, what you can do is you can go to apps uh, and there is something called as a GPU coder here. Uh, GPU coder. So this will help you generate the CUDA code from the MATLAB code. Again, I'm not going into details now because there is not time, uh, but you can definitely try this out. Okay. Um, I hope that's interesting to people. I guess at least for computer scientists, it's very, very interesting. Uh, let me finish because we're out of time. So let me just finish by showing you the batch submission part on the cluster. So, so that's it for the GPU part. Uh, the code is with you, so you can try this out in your own time. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the parallel server workshop to the batch submission folder. Uh, and now my uh, cluster is actually online. Okay, the cluster I just created, it is now online. So I can submit jobs to that cluster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to home, parallel. First, I'm going to select that cluster, DC underscore test. Uh, I can also try to validate it if I want. So if I validate this cluster, uh, it will just check if I can connect to it. It will create a job and it will you know, run some few tests on it. And if all of them are green, I should be able to submit jobs. Uh, in the case of your cluster, cluster profile, the last job will fail because you won't have access to a parallel pool, uh, but the first four jobs will pass. So that is okay. Yeah, this will just take two minutes. Uh, sorry about running over time. Uh, if you need to go, this will be recorded in any case. So you will get the recording and all the code is with you. So a, a job is being created right now. Um, once that passes, it will try a couple of more things. And then basically we'll be able to submit a batch job and get the results back. Yeah, when you're in a hurry, it always takes a long time. Uh, this is taking forever, I don't know why. Okay, so finally it has managed to create a job at that remote cluster. Um, it's just going to do another couple of things to check the communication and then check the pool. Um, I'm just going to stop the validation here because I don't want to waste your time. Um, if this is passed, I know the rest will probably pass anyway. Let me just show you how to submit jobs and get results. Okay, so I'll stop this. Uh, and that will free up MATLAB to submit the job. So the same uh, batch job that I had before, you know, in this uh, ML01 batch intro solution, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the code a little bit. So the batch uh, job is submitted to the remote cluster. Okay. So let's just open the script. <clears throat> Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's still stuck trying to do the validation on this. Yeah, okay, finally. Okay, so uh, suppose that I wanted to submit a batch job uh, to that uh, remote place. Now, the only thing I have to change here is actually I can just uh, add the name of the cluster. Otherwise, what I can do is I can go to home parallel and then select the remote cluster as my default. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to take the same job that I used to have before. Uh, and I'm going to ask for 12 workers because I have more workers now. Um, and then when I submit this batch job, this time it will not go to my local computer. It will go and get submitted on that computer, which is sitting in that cluster. So let me just try that. Uh, and once this job has been successfully submitted, we'll be able to see it in the job monitor as well. So you will notice that it takes a lot of time to actually submit a job because what is happening is all the files on my side are now getting packaged up and they are being transmitted over to the internet to the place where that cluster is sitting. So sometimes it takes a couple of seconds just for the transmission process to happen. Um, if you have a lot of data, it will take a lot of, uh, you know, base time just to transmit the job forward and backwards. So <clears throat> it's best to have jobs uh, where you don't have to transmit a lot of data. Uh, it, it's better to have more computation than data. Uh, being sent remotely. Uh, if you need to work with a lot of data, then you have to make sure that it is stored in a location on the cluster itself, uh, such that it can be accessed by the cluster. Because what you don't want is packaging up 5 GB of data and then sending it uh, and then getting the results back. It will take you know days to do that. So when you're working on your HPC, just make sure the files are locally accessible. Uh, by the cluster, and then it will be able to process those much, much faster. Uh, so this is just uh, running the job right now. Let's see if it finish. Okay, so I have got 12 tasks finished with no errors, one warning. Uh, maybe I'll just see the warning later on. Uh, and I can fetch the results back from the client. Okay, so you see it throws up a warning. The reason it is throwing up the warning is because my data are needed to be transmitted to the remote computer. So it's just warning me not to use this current folder parameter uh, and use probably something else. But in any case, the results are here um, and I can use this uh, for whatever is needed. Okay. Uh, so basically that's how batch job submissions work. Uh, you have to get the cluster profile first of all. You know, you will just import it in your case, uh, then validate it properly. So I stopped it here because we are running out of time, but you can validate it properly. The first four will pass and the last one will fail. Uh, after that, it's just a case of taking your files, submitting a batch job, waiting for it to finish, and then fetching the results back. Okay, so we are over time, so I'll wrap up now. Uh, just to summarize everything we've covered today, uh, I know it was a little bit of a rush, but that's that's the way it is. So the first thing to do is, you know, just try to optimize your serial code, make sure it runs faster. Uh, try to use built-in functions and then the C++ method we showed before. Next step is, if that doesn't solve your problem, next step, use parallel computing toolbox on your desktop machine. Uh, and try to use all of the CPU cores. So in 90% of cases, that will actually solve the problem. Uh, and the functions to remember are basically, you know, par4 is the main one. You can also use par FAVIL or par sim for different tasks. And then the final thing is, if even that is not sufficient, then you will need to scale up to a cluster uh, using MATLAB parallel server. And the key thing to do there is to submit the job as a batch command. Uh, my email is here. I will just share it with all of you. Uh, 
I hope this has been useful. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I can take them at this point. Are there any questions uh, or any doubts? Okay, ma'am, shall we end yes. the session? Now? Yes, yes, we can end. Okay, so there is a question how to do it for the MNNIT cluster. So, ma'am, what uh, we will need to do in that case is the profile that is saved on one of your test machines, right? Yes. Uh, so, what we can do is there is a button called export actually let me just show it here right now uh, sorry i'm just going to share my screen again quickly so on your cluster uh, sorry on your test machines that you use to test the cluster one of these profiles will already be set up uh, i don't know what it will be called but that profile you just select it and then we click export okay, okay. So that one file will be there. Then that can be passed to whoever needs to use on some other computer. So they can import it and they will get the cluster profile. Okay, uh, fine. After, yeah, after they've got it, then we just set that as default. Mm. Uh, and then we can, you know, try submitting some jobs. So maybe it will be worth just testing once inside the computer center and then sharing with the rest. Yeah, I'll test that tomorrow and then uh, accordingly I'll share with the participants by two, within two days. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that will have uh, given people a lot to think about. Uh, yeah, do feel free to reach out if you if you need anything else. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruv. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm just repeating. Pasting the attendance sheet link, ma'am, if everyone can just okay. take a look. And Deepshika, it. kindly share the uh, recording also, and including of the course, PPT material, okay, including the doc, PPT also. What sure, was using sure, to deliver his lecture. Okay. Of course, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am.